So um, the uh, attendance paper is circulating. Start from here again. Newcomers, please sign only once for this hour. <coughs> not twice, as you were not here last hour. All right. Um, so please. In the previous slide, I was talking about the changing profile of terrorist groups, their motivations, their organization, and their capabilities are changing. This does not mean that the so-called old school or old fashioned or traditional or older, however you name it, this doesn't mean that these groups are out, are obsolete. No, they exist. They still continue to carry out attacks or pursue whatever goals they have. But what is important to underline here is that, of course, if we are to concentrate ourselves on one of the threats on the horizon, it is worth considering more, especially the threat posed by weapons of mass destruction. No matter how pro uh, low uh, the probability might be, but should it occur, the consequences of an attack with weapons of mass destruction, even if it is not a sophisticated attack, or even if it may not the yield, the, um, the, the result that may naturally come from a weapons of mass destruction attack, still this is a uh, very scary scenario. Because, I mean, there are certain reasons why the, chain, the new type of transnational terrorist organizations may wish to carry out attacks with weapons of mass destruction. There are certain reasons. Yes, of course, there is this debate going on in academia as well as uh, in the security circles. Whether this is a really uh, serious threat. How serious is the threat posed by uh, the uh, you know, terrorist activities um, with weapons of mass destruction. I'm going to open a website here. Um, let's, where is it? Sorry. This is the website of uh, the Center of Excellence Defense Against Terrorism. Did I write correctly? See that? I guess. Here we go. I mean, here this is the journal where I'm the editor in chief. If you send an article, you may manage to get it published, of course, provided it's a good one. And this is volume two, number two, that is uh, fall 2009. And I suggest all of you to read this article. Do we really need to worry some reflections on the threat of nuclear terrorism by Peter Zimmerman? He is one of the very few people who can really make any comment on this subject. Because some people tend to exaggerate the dimensions of the problem with respect to the threat posed by weapons of mass destruction terrorism because they do not, they do not know necessarily the technicalities or the scientific aspects of this as to how this could be realized. And, but on the other hand, some tend to under, undermine the threat or underestimate not only the probability, but also the consequences on the grounds that, well, so far there, have, uh, there has not been any significant you know, attack with weapons of mass destruction. Why should we worry that much? Peter Zimmerman uh, actually is making this analysis, not just by blah, blah, not, not at all, but he is saying, here are the capabilities, here are the technical uh, scientific capabilities, material capabilities, and here is what is needed to carry out this kind of attacks, and here are the capabilities of organizations, and therefore this is possible. On that hand, the second article, Charles Ferguson, again uh, a friend, and he is now the president of uh, Federation of American Scientists, FAS, is one of the think tanks, and is, which maintains a very important website, where, uh, which most uh, researchers around the world visit from time to time, because it is very rich in terms of uh, knowledge, information, fas.org. 
um, Charles Ferguson and uh, Misha Smith, they have co-authored this piece and they assess the possibility of uh, uh, and, and also the uh, effects, consequence of a ra radiological attack. And this is something what, that most people knowingly or unknowingly, correctly or incorrectly, call dirty bombs. Not sophisticated weapons, not weapons per se that, could, that might have any military usefulness, but something that can uh, cause you know, the effects that I will just ma uh, mention in a moment. Uh, and therefore, we, which are actually such weapons within the reach of terrorist organizations, and both authors explain in very much detail. And these are articles that you are uh, definitely required to read by the time of the final exam. So the website, go ahead here, coe.natoint, and uh, this is Center of Excellence Defense Against Terrorism. This is Defense Against Terrorism Review. And, well, this is the editor's note. You may or may not read it. <laughs> you know this guy. And Peter Zimmerman and Charles Ferguson, two leading authorities in the world who may have a lot to say about this uh, issue. Of course, uh, others are suggested to read. Well, Roham, uh, Noah Hamim actually is one of the most people call next generation brightest scientists. He's still doing his PhD uh, in Israel. So, therefore, the, two, the first two articles are uh, required and in which you will sort of uh, read in much more detail and understand properly, I hope, uh, issues that uh, I, I'm now going to mention here. So, um, why WMD? Why is it that, oops, what, was the, what the problem is? Um, have you watched National Security? Uh, the movie. National security, no? Okay. So, um, the reason why WMD might be attractive or might be the weapon of choice by the new type of terrorist organizations are uh, a few, uh, actually. But before going on this, uh, with this subject, I would like to emphasize something. Of course, I cannot make a definitive comment. I cannot say the so-called traditional or old school, old-fashioned old or older, or the previously existing terrorist organizations, if you want to be much des des uh, descriptive, uh, these kind of terrorist organizations would most likely not resort to weapons of mass destruction because they, have, they are politically motivated, they are ideologically motivated, they have separatist ambitions, and in order to uh, sort of uh, pursue their ambitions, their goals, they need not only logistical support, financial support, or otherwise, they also need political support. And most ideologically motivated separatist, uh, you know, old-fashioned, so to speak, terrorist organizations need to uh, create a certain degree of legitimacy in the eyes of, if not their own population, I mean, the population where, within which they operate, but in the eyes of the world populations. So they need a certain degree of sympathy. They need a certain degree of legitimacy. And therefore, by carrying out a, a, attacks with weapons of mass destruction, they, would, they, they will most likely, if they do so, they will most likely lose this legitimacy or a, a huge proportion of it. So it is not expected from terrorist organizations like the PKK the IRA, the ETA, and Tamils do not exist anymore. Well, you know, of course, there are people, mutants uh, spread uh, to different parts of the world because of the heavy attack that they, 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 so they were subject to. Uh, and there is an article in this journal uh, in the coming issue, actually, uh, on the Tamil Tigers anyway, uh, by uh, Ahmet Hashim. Is, uh, uh, not the Ahmet Hashim that you know from Turkish novel. Uh, but... Um, an expert on this issue. And because these organizations would not like to lose the legitimacy that they have built painstakingly in the eyes of large populations around the world. So weapons of mass destruction, I cannot say definitively. I, I cannot say, well, they will never. No, I, no one can say. No one can know what 
might be the weapon of choice by terrorist organizations for reasons that I mentioned here. Uh, terrorist organizations, this is also applicable to transnational terrorist organizations, they are not necessarily bound by moral restraints. So you cannot expect a certain degree of more morality or a certain degree of responsible behavior. If the so-called traditional terrorist organizations will not resort to weapons of mass destruction, this is most likely, not definitive, of course. This is not because this is, Im this is found to be immoral by them. I don't think they have any such concerns. But this is not found to be practical, and this is something that may cause a huge drop in the legitimacy in the eyes of the rest of the population. So, therefore, weapons of mass destruction might be preferred, if at all are going to be preferred, might be preferred by what we call the transnational terrorist organizations which are motivated by religious beliefs or mystical beliefs because they are not bound by moral restraint of political ideology that they would require them to seek the support of populations within which they operate. And the second reason is some transnational terrorist organizations are reportedly committed to taking the revenge of millions who have been allegedly victimized in the hands of the infidels. Well, what does this mean? There are reports or uh, news that we see from time to time that the leadership cadre, either an individual or just a, you know, a note sent to the press or a video or something broadcast on uh, news channels, and there is this talk of uh, you know, crusaders you know, taking the lives of millions of uh, uh, Muslims around the world, of course, more, more specifically in the greater Middle Eastern area. And so far throughout history, there were you know, five or six or so millions of uh, them who were killed in the hands of the crusaders. And their revenge will be taken, this is for sure. This is what, what is you know, propagated. And they say, you know, uh, we are going to take this revenge. So considering that on 9-11, on September 11, 2001, there were approximately 3,000 people who were killed in that incident. And if you talk about millions, like six millions or three millions of uh, Muslims killed in the hands of the infidels throughout these crusade, crusades, well, of course, by such individual attacks which may claim the lives of, say, 5,000, 10,000, well, that requires a number of, or maybe thousands of such attacks. But an attack with weapons of mass destruction, with, with a nuclear weapon, for instance, or chemical or biological weapons, or by radiological material, the casualty rate might be much higher. And therefore, if these groups, as reported in the media or in some academic research, if they are after taking the revenge of the millions of people, and if they are going to attack, they would most likely prefer weapons of mass destruction in order to attain such a goal. So this, there is this logical consequence, there is this correlation which makes the possibility and therefore the probability, and because of possibility, and the probability of uh, WMD, weapons of mass destruction, being the weapon of choice, a much bigger one uh, in terms of probability. And as I just mentioned here in the previous hour, access to nuclear, chemical, biological weapons and material used in the manufacture of these weapons, well, I don't mean to say it's all easy. I mean, if you just go with a you know, suitcase full of... Uh, greens, uh, you know, banknotes, uh, thousands of millions of dollars, whatever. You cannot just, you know, shop around, well, give me two chemical weapons, well, just one package of biological agents, and, well, two SS-20s. Well, you cannot do so easily, of course. This is not that an open market. But for countries or groups, transnational networks, because they are actually comrades I mean, friends against the common enemy, they may easily cooperate in opening the, each other's illicit network. Uh, and by, you know, through these networks, they may have access to these weapons or the material. Well, I, I, I never said this, it is easy. Sometimes, even though I, I emphasize this maybe 10 times in the exam papers, students write, 
it is very easy to get well. well. No one is saying that. No one says it is easy. But for transnational networks, which have access to other networks, which are committed and which are endow, uh, which have endowed themselves with competent people, some of them are former security uh, analysts. Some of them are military personnel, high ranking. Some of them are even diplomats or scientists. They know where to go, how to go, whom to meet, and what to get, and what to assemble together. So for committed groups and states, these are not beyond the reach, and these are not extremely difficult. I don't mean to say it's easy, not at all, but something that is doable. So therefore, when combined with this uh, uh, ambition and this possibility, WMD is not a remote possibility anymore. And there is also another factor. The fear factor is something that makes it all the more attractive. Because even if the WMD attack may not be successful or may not yield the results the terrorist organization may have expected from the weapon or the material they used, the fear factor, the, the havoc that will be created among the public and people say, look, you know, these are so powerful, these are so capable people that even there are, you know, tens of dozens or, or country states fighting against them, they can still stage these attacks in the middle of a city here. So this will cause a fear among society, which is one of the most important, if not the most important, sort of uh, uh, objectives of terrorist organizations is to cause fear among the population. Because after all, no terrorist activity is without a purpose. And in most cases, if not in all, because there are certain targeted assassinations, but in most cases, targets are, or the victims are not necessarily targets. These are not people who are necessarily, uh, you know, uh, whose lives mean anything uh, to the terrorist organizations. But the mere fact that there are high rate of casualties and type of weapon may cause huge uh, amount of fear within the society. When we talk about weapons of mass destruction, we know very well, we talk about basically three categories of weapons. Nuclear weapons and chemical weapons and biological weapons. And nuclear weapons are explosive devices. That, this is my definition. I don't know where it's a good one, but just you know, bear in mind are explosive devices that release huge amounts of energy and radiation achieved by splitting the fissile material, highly enriched uranium or plutonium. So nuclear weapons, we have seen the effects in, uh, well, at least in documentaries, we have seen uh, the effects of the explosions in uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, in a simple second, thousands of people died and other tens of thousands, thousands of Others died from radiation, from cancer, from burning bodies, etc. Chemical weapons are actually toxic chemical substances that cause incapacitation. Incapacitation means you cannot move, you cannot do anything, you cannot fight, you cannot just even, uh, you can barely survive. Cause incapacitation, injury, or death of humans and animals due to severe burnings and their effects on the nervous or respiratory system because these are chemical substances mostly in form of gas, some of them are in liquid form and of course depending on which type of chemical weapons the effects may be uh, faster, slower or wider in terms of uh, outreach etc. And biological weapons, actually the term biological weapon is a misnomer, is not a proper term because biological agents are living microorganisms which are deliberately spread into the air, into the atmosphere uh, in order to cause infectious diseases for again incapacitating people or killing the target population including humans, animals and plants. So these are three different categories of weapons which are not necessarily totally beyond the reach of terrorist organizations, especially transnational terrorist organizations because the classical ones for reasons that I explained even if they may have access to these weapons, even if they can get these weapons, they may not necessarily use in their attacks because they would not like, most probably, we, don't, we cannot make any definitive comment, but they would not like to lose their legitimacy, whatever legitimacy that might be in the eyes of 
other countries' populations. And therefore, uh, uh, these three categories of weapons and a certain uh, you know, uh, other category, which is called radiological weapons or dirty bombs, these are you know, uh, so-called material, not necessarily a weapon, because weapon is a meter term. Weapon is something whose consequences or uh, the, the, the uh, extent of the yield effect uh, is more or less known to the, the commander in the battlefield. You know, you know what kind of effect a nuclear, weapons, nuclear weapon might have, or chemical or biological weapon. But there are certain material, radiological material, so some dump chemicals, some, uh, if not, a, you know, a purely uh, worked out, but some, you know, some uh, raw agents, let's say, if explode or just spread into the air, may still cause, if not, you know, large uh, n numbers of casualties, but may create havoc or just panic in the society. Of course, the question is after, you know, whether terrorist organizations would or could use WMD, and having seen what type of WMDs exist, you know, in the world, and which one and why might be the weapon of choice, the most preferred. So I would like to concentrate a little bit on this subject, which is something which hopefully, not yet, uh, became a reality. But you know, uh, this is one of the scary scenarios in my mind. I mean, this is something that you know, keeps me awake. Um, of course, I'm not in a position to make anything concrete other than you know, raising awareness in the public or teaching you this subject for some of you um, in your future capacities might somehow pay more attention when you become a politician or a decision maker. But something that, uh, or whose probability as well as possibility uh, concern me a lot. And this is, of course, indeed, and in principle, all categories of weapons of mass destruction are equally attractive, especially to transnational terrorist organizations. But nuclear and chemical materials are visible, and they're also detectable because they emit radiation. And it is difficult to smuggle these material because transnational terrorist organizations, they would need um, some very you know, specific hideouts, some, some places where they would have to develop something, if not a weapon, but something crude, something dirty, well, bomb, whatever. And they would have to do beyond reach of, you know, security forces uh, in, uh, away from the eyes of the intelligence units, etc. But still, they would have to, you know, uh, mobile in, in, in certain times because they would have to take some material from one place to another. And considering that there are thousands of detectors everywhere in big cities, especially. The ke uh, chemical substance detectors, uh, nuclear material detectors, as well as biological bioagents detectors. It is very difficult to smuggle these, but it is all the more difficult in the nuclear and chemical area because you know, uh, even the, the, the lowest uh, uh, non-sophisticated detect detecting machines, detectors might detect them. But uh, biological agents are not that easy to detect. And, of course, um, there are many ways of carrying this because these are living organisms and they can be carried out within the body of a sick man uh, who's, I mean, uh, who may carry a contagious uh, you know, illness or there are other methods, there are other motives and whatever. So certain unique features of biological agents make biological weapons, unfortunately, I use this as a, in quotations as, perfect terrorist weapons of choice. This, these are weapons that may be preferred uh, by terrorist organizations for reasons that I will explain right in the next slide here. Um, <clears throat> the threat of biological weapons and bioterrorism, actually this is a separate field, this is a separate um, expose that I uh, you know, had several times I used in my 
conferences, uh, classes, and you can find, again, on my website as a separate uh, uh, presentation, but I brought in here to this uh, presentation some important slides. Uh, for, for fullest uh, presentation, you may have to go to my website and go to the PowerPoints and pick up the uh, one with the, threat, uh, the title, Trade of Weapons, Bioweapons and Bioterrorism. Bi biological agents can be dispersed by simple vehicles such as civilian aircraft, agricultural sprayers, when equipped with a fan and specialized ventilators, or by choosing just simply an upwind location, Beleshtepe in some stadiums, as you know, somewhere up at, 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 by watching the wind, you can just release the agent that would, with the help of the wind, may just go toward the you know, population center. So, I mean, for a chemical weapon or biological weapon or chemical biological material that would be you know, exploded with some uh, uh, high explosives, I mean, you would have to assemble a, some, a, some sort of a sophisticated device that you would have to take from one place to another with some uh, detectable you know, uh, deliver, deliver vehicles or the material themselves may be detected before they are delivered from one place to another. But in the case of uh, biological agents, it's, uh, they can be delivered by some um, vehicles that are used almost every now and then everywhere without you know, necessarily giving out any sort of a signal that they are going to do anything uh, malign, anything you know, harmful to the you know, uh, population. Um, what is important here is because biological agents, except for toxins, well, if this is a spectrum of, uh, let's say, chemical weapons and biological weapons are a certain material here, this area is what I call toxin. Because toxins are in between this chemical and biological weapons area. These are, I mean, these are artificial material produced, I mean, artificially generated in uh, labs. Biological agents are living organisms that are found in nature, and toxins are actually in between. They are not necessarily living. Some uh, might be, but um, these are not uh, also, they are not necessarily created in, uh, in the laboratories but because there are some toxins in nature. Cobra venom, for instance, some toxic you know, uh, uh, material in the bodies of some uh, animals or some uh, some plants so therefore it is somewhere in between here anyway uh, with the exception of toxins biological agents I mean these are microbes that you know when when you're ill there is a biological agent in your body which infected your body which incapacitated your body to some extent and caused this illness and what makes this a biological weapon quote unquote is that this illness you know, is brought into your body not through natural occurrence like interpersonal communication and by, uh, you know, by chance you get this uh, microbe from someone who is just you know, uh, you know, spreading this. But in, in the case of biologic weapons, some people deliberately disperse this into the air. And in the past, for instance, uh, Chinese uh, Japanese have conducted biological weapons tests in Manchuria. I mean, all throughout the you know, uh, 1920s and 30s, especially the 1930s, before the Second World War. And they tested biological agents, and they observed, they visualized which biological agent and how does it kill, uh, what is the length of you know, illness and what is the type of you know, uh, dying or what, 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 what suffering by the humans, etc. They tested the Japanese, the Imperial Japan, not Japan of today, of course. Uh, Imperial Japan tested biological agents on real human people who were mostly prisoners and some also were villagers. Anyway, so, and th these are agents that you know, cause illness but since they cause this illness, just like any illness, then you know, almost all of you, all of us have suffered in the past and maybe even today, it takes time. It is not like an instant 
uh, or instantly happening thing, like a nuclear weapon is dropped, you know, people are killed in instantly in a split second, or chemical weapons are dropped, it takes, if not minutes or seconds, it takes several minutes maybe, unless you are properly uh, protected against with the, you know, gas mask or the, the, the gear, uh, thing that you, you have to put on your body. But biological agents, once they enter the body, and if there's enough dose which uh, enters the body, it takes some time to multiply within the body to cause a certain degree of illness. And therefore, uh, and not only in the human beings, but also animals as well as uh, uh, plants. So it takes time to develop. Uh, sometimes, in some cases, it may take days and even weeks. And in some cases, some toxins like aflatoxin, for instance, it causes the liver cancer within three, four, or five years. So the person might be subject to this toxin, and within two, three years, or five years, he or she might die just because of this toxin, which may be somehow injected to his body or just through uh, inhaling something, uh, whatever. So therefore, biological agents, uh, th their effects take time, days, weeks, even longer. And therefore, um, let's see the next slide. Due to, due to this, uh, the, uh, the effects that are delayed, biological agents, they can be used for attacking fixed targets, such as uh, densely populated residential areas, airports, naval bases, naval ports, civil emergency, and other uh, vital public services. If a terrorist organization uh, tr decides to attack a country and wants to kill thousands or, or t tens of or hundreds of thousands of people, and if they think biological agent is the weapon of choice because of some of the quote-unquote advantages from their perspective, of course they may wish to use this uh, agent against some fixed targets where the population may be subject or may be exposed to this material, to this agent, and they can do so without being noticed. Because when there's an explosion, everybody hears and the security units are dispatched to the area and people, you know, create a, 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 within a certain perimeter, they start searching. And it, sometimes uh, those who are responsible for the attack, even if, if they, they, are, they have not died already within the attack, if it's not a suicide bombing, they can be arrested with some effective search and pursuit of these people. Because now, I mean, you know that just five minutes ago there was such and such attack somewhere, you heard the explosion, and if you uh, take controls in the entry points or exit points of the city, and if you just uh, conduct an effective search, you may or may not reach to these people who are responsible. But in this case, it takes days and weeks. How can you know when actually that agent was released or who released it anyway? So therefore, it, uh, it, it, it creates a certain uh, advantages from the terrorist perspective because they can, after having committed or staged their attack, they can just disappear, go to the farthest uh, uh, distance from the uh, location of attack, and they can just uh, disappear within the population because they will most likely not be known when actually they have attacked or when they have staged an attack. This is um, something also why biologic agents are more attractive to terrorist organizations but not necessarily to states. In the past, as I said, like Japan did, Imperial Japan in the 30s against the Chinese when they occupied Manchuria, or other states uh, have conducted chemical and biological weapons research and they also built these weapons. They had certain things in mind. There was also this stiff rise between, uh, race between uh, the states with, with, with governments. So they produced large amounts of chem uh, chemical and biological weapons, especially biological weapons. But one thing must be definitely borne in mind is that if a, a, an area it could be an open a village area or just a residential area. If that area is contaminated by a biological agent, it is very difficult to decontaminate. 
Because, I mean, if and when chemical weapon or chemical agent is used in, in an area, due to the effects of sun or wind or other weather conditions, the chemical substance, even by its own, just disappear after a while. Just, it might take hours or days at most. And then that area might be safely used by the large populations. But if biological agent is you know, used in an area, and if the area is contaminated, and especially if it's an agriculture area, these, these agents, which are living organisms, will somehow uh, survive under the uh, toughest weather conditions from minus 50 degrees Celsius to plus 50 degrees Celsius in you know, the most freezing or hottest weather conditions, climatic conditions, and they can be carried from one place to another by birds, especially, etc. So therefore, it is not wise for any state to use biological agents in their attacks because if they do not have any ambition to occupy a territory and gain territory, well, they might use it. But still, you may never be 100% sure as to whether you can contain the, the uh, sort of effects of the spread of biological agent. We have seen in the SARS, in the birds flu, in the swine flu, that because of this you know, uh, huge rate of uh, uh, you know, transportation, of you know, transfers of people from one point to another, millions of them, even the uh, smallest number of uh, incidents may increase overnight. So therefore, and if a state has any ambition to gain territory, it would be totally unwise to use biologic agents in that territory because they cannot decontaminate 100% and they cannot open to resi residents of their population or, or to agriculture. So it would be loss of their territory even if you fought for it. So therefore, it is not something that the states would uh, uh, aim in, in their attacks. But since terrorist organizations, especially transnational terrorist organizations, unlike the so-called traditional separatists which fight for a certain territory, transnational terrorist organizations are not known as having any ambition to occupy a territory or separate a territory. And therefore, because they don't have any such territorial claims, even for this reason, biological agents might be a weapon of choice in addition to the other factors that might make it more attractive from their perspective. And in addition to that, of course, the cost of establishing a biological weapons program is not as high as any others. Well, of course, when compared to uh, IED, improvised explosive devices, IED, improvised ex explosive device, um, of course, this is maybe the cheapest, maybe the easiest. Still, there are certain complications. But when compared to other categories of weapons of mass destruction, biological agents are easier in terms of uh, knowledge required. Of course, still not easy. Don't write anything like this. Well, it is very easy to have a biological weapons program. No, not at all. But because of the composition of the transnational organization that we mentioned earlier, there are people who are well-educated, who are competent, and in their previous uh, occupations, careers, they may have had access to these weapons, or they may have even produced these weapons themselves. So you don't know. And these people, either because of their mystical beliefs or religious beliefs, may join the ranks of this kind of transnational organizations, or they may be forced to do so. Or they may be motivated, they may be incited, they may be uh, in encouraged to join the ranks, they may be given large amounts of money, or they, their lives or their family's life may be threatened, or they may just you know, want to take revenge from the institutions, from the country that they were sort of uh, uh, hired as, a, as an academic or as a researcher. So, therefore, it is another factor that uh, uh, make it uh, attractive from a terrorist perspective. Of course, uh, what is important here, it is the task of the state, the you know, polity, as we call it, or the political structures, ministries, 
organizations, institutions, agencies within the state and also international or at the international level or in the international arena, they are entitled to take these measures and it is their duty. You cannot just, they cannot just say, well, I don't care, this is your problem. It's, it's the very purpose of their being, their raison d'etre. So, therefore, this is important. And there are basically two types of measures that can be taken, defensive and offensive measures, to preempt or to prevent. Well, this preemption is not necessarily the type of prevention that W. Bush Jr. mentioned in his preemptive war. This is preemption uh, in terms of you know, stopping or uh, arresting the, those who are contemplating of attacking or using any type of weapons of mass destruction or, or any type of weapons in their attacks against uh, most likely innocent civilians or even security forces. It doesn't mean that security forces are, in, are not innocent either. So, therefore, especially those who are you know, serving Dimitri as part of draft, they may or may not have any uh, intention to serve the country, but they are taken uh, to this position and they have to serve as part of their citizenship duty. So therefore, it is important to preempt and prevent, preempt in order to disrupt, to, to, to sort of, uh, 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 you know, take such measures that, that would, before even they start, you know, uh, carrying the attack, or prevent at a time of attack or uh, at some point. So these measures are both offensive and defensive. Um, Let me just go uh, to the next stage here. Within NATO, there are such capabilities that are now being put together, which I will not go into very much detail. And I will send this email, uh, PowerPoint slide with, uh, with, the, with an email. And there is this WMD Center at the NATO headquarters, which was established about a decade ago, which is becoming even more effective every uh, every other year. So now there is this uh, issue as to how to prevent it. Because this is the, if not the single most challenge, but something that is being recurring as the most threatening theme subject in the, uh, what is called the defense white papers or nation security uh, policies, strategies, uh, strategic documents that you know uh, different governments uh, issue from time to time. While on the one hand, there is this group of people who definitely, knowingly and consciously, undermine the threat posed by weapons of mass destruction for their own good reason. And I'm not in a place to comment on on these sort of uh, arguments because they so believe and they do not believe in the probability even, or the possibility of, uh, and therefore they do not believe in probability of uh, a, you know, terrorism with weapons of mass destruction. While on the one hand, there is this group of people, and they say this is all you know, um, conspiracies that, like any other conspiracies, serve the very purpose of uh, big states in order to keep people under a constant state of uh, a mind full of fear in order to impose their hegemonic uh, policies. This is one view. There is also another view which just look at the capabilities as well as the intentions of the organizations and say, as I always say here, threat is a combination of capabilities and intentions. The problem here, of course, threat is a combination of capabilities and intentions. Well, we understand from the publications, from the broadcasts, from the messages, or uh, here and there, just, you know, uh, whenever they just surface and they uh, are made public uh, from time to time, that existing transnational terrorist networks, either directly from their leaders or someone within the leadership cadre, they express quite 
explicitly, unequivocally, when, without any ambiguity. They explain their intentions that they want to do certain things, they want to cause some damage to particularly a number of countries such as the United States, Israel, in the first place. They also threaten some other states. For instance, in one of the most recent videotapes of Osama bin Laden, uh, who is the leader of the Al-Qaeda network, he also threatened Turkey or someone from his you know, cadre, uh, if not in a direct way, but in an indirect way, and threatened Turkey not to be so close with the United States and especially Israel, so as not to be uh, also found guilty by them that could divert their attention also towards Turkey and might, might make Turkey target of Al-Qaeda. So, therefore, intentions of the existing networks, I don't think is debatable. It is something that they have made it quite uh, explicit, for sure. The problem is, in order to gauge, I mean, whether the threat is up or down or constant, we have to, I mean, this is sure constant, I mean, uh, in, in the increase. I mean, they, every now and, they, uh, now and then they explain their uh, plans. What about capabilities? Yes, there are some reports, conflicting reports, which may not uh, be so much convincing about their exact capabilities. And it's not always possible to know exactly what you know, uh, specifically they may have. But looking at what they have done and what they are, or what kind of people you know, are found you know, in, in these organizations, and these, this information comes from the, the ones who are arrested or through intelligence uh, units who are infiltrated into this group, they see that you know, we can say that if not very uh, fast, but the capabilities are also increasing. So there is this intention as well as capabilities which are, you know, uh, going in the direction that we wouldn't like to see. And therefore, trade is something that we can con conclude is increasing. Well, again, low probability, but high and unbearable consequences. The, the answer to whether the, or like uh, Peter Zimmerman, like Pete has mentioned in, the, in his article, is here, whether we should really be, we should be really worried, I think it's up to you. You will make this judgment yourselves. I only try to give you a picture with an unbiased picture to the extent possible based on my research, ob objective and scientific research. And I talk about their intentions, which are rather clear. I commented on their capabilities, which are known to be, there are some hard evidence, convincing evidence, uh, or sub substantial evidence about their increasing capabilities. Or there are some facilitating factors that may help them increase their capabilities. And therefore, it is the threat is on the rise. Well, it doesn't mean that it's going to hit tomorrow. We don't know. Or maybe 10 years from today. We don't know. But the problem is here, whether there is, regardless of whether this is a low probability, high consequence, your decision will depend on are you ready to bear the consequences if and when attack has occurred. So if you can say, well, I don't care, well, if it's going to happen, que sera, sera, you can just, you know, this is not a typical uh, statementship, but you may just not care mu much about this threat. But if you're concerned and if you, are, if you, if you feel responsible, then the even the, with the lowest probability regarding it, capabilities and intentions, your calculation of the threat posed by especially this type of terrorism and its possible consequences must give you some clue about what kind of decision you should have with respect to uh, this issue. All right, um, on Friday, please let every single member of your teams that there will be a rehearsal in the last 20 minutes of the course, or maybe during the course, I don't know, and uh, that every member should be here because I see some members of some groups uh, actually are constantly uh, violating their obligations uh, towards their team members. So it is better if everyone is here on Friday 
there will be a rehearsal. We will just see, uh, you know, how uh, we should proceed with the simulation. And that will be something that will facilitate. And I may give you some hints if I see something that you would have to, uh, you, or you would need to correct before you uh, just uh, go uh, uh, to, to you know, enjoy the weekend. All right, I'll see you on Friday. And don't forget to read these two articles but for the final. You are responsible. I did not send with, uh, as an attachment or in the mail, but Peter Zimmerman and Charles Ferguson together with Michel Smith the first two articles you're responsible for. I'll see you later. Thanks for coming.